um, I'm going to talk about um, connections. And some of you may remember from long ago, a really very nice book and PBS series by James Burke um, that looked at the history of ideas and technology. Yes. Thank you. So Mr. Burke had this great series where he talked about the history of scientific ideas putting them in a historical context and explaining um, how it worked. Um, you know, well, the connections, let me just say it that way. And the series was known for demonstrations of various technologies, a lot of which had to do with war. And it was a lot of fun. And Thank I you. thought it would be fun yeah. to do this for um, modern physics. And in particular, um, two ideas in physics called critical universality and um, duality. And I will explain what those are as we go. So where I'm starting is in 1924, a man by the name of Ernst Ising, uh, a German Jew, and he asked the question, why do permanent magnets exist? This was the early days of quantum physics and uh, people were looking for deep explanations of many of the phenomena that they saw around them, mostly a lot of atomic phenomena, uh, electromagnetic phenomena. And of course, it was obvious that there are uh, permanent magnets, right? Compass needles are permanent magnets. Many of us have played in toys with the uh, permanent magnets. If not um, recently, well, perhaps recently with grandchildren or something. Um, Picture but, of the uh, giant grandchild. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we know that they exist, but why do they exist? How do they exist? What is the physics that leads to them existing? And what he did was he modeled magnetic domains as spins on a lattice. So um, if you imagine that you have a one dimensional system, right? I can think of the magnetic domains, which are actually very complicated uh, things that depend on the material as being simply things that take on the values plus or minus one or up or down, like so. This is a one dimensional lattice, but we could imagine a two dimensional system or a three dimensional system as well. And he said, well, each one of these is gonna be plus or minus one. And there's going to be an interaction between each nearest neighbor, okay? And so everybody interacts with the spins next to them, but there's no sort of global interaction. It's all, all local. And he was asked to look at this problem by his advisor, Willem Lentz, who is a pretty well-known physicist of the time. And he was able to prove that um, you get a permanent magnet only at exactly zero temperature, that any uh, temperature would lead to thermal fluctuations and you don't get a permanent magnet, okay? And he conjectured that this was true for two-dimensional magnets and three-dimensional magnets. So this wasn't the explanation uh, in his view of why permanent magnets exist. Now he was wrong in this, okay? He was misled by the one dimensional nature of the system he was able to solve. He wasn't able to solve the two dimensional system, which is much harder. And to this day, no one has been able to solve the three dimensional system. Um, I have heard yeah. Okay, could you please yeah. all please mute, mute yourself? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. And 
um, he had a very interesting but somewhat tragic history, um, as uh, a lot of people did in those years around World War II. So, um, so Ising got his PhD, and as part of his PhD, he uh, you know did this work on this model, uh, and he got a job and was doing fine. And then Hitler came to power, and Ising was Jewish, uh, but his wife was not. And they were both professors. They fled to Luxembourg from Germany in the early days of World War II. Um, but then Luxembourg was uh, inv invaded by the Nazis. And somehow, because Ising's wife was not Jewish, she was able to keep her job and, and I think to a certain extent protect him. And he lost his job, but he was not sent to the concentration camps, but he was forced into various forms of menial labor all during the war. And when the war was over, um, he and his wife uh, immigrated to the United States and settled in Peoria, Illinois, where they worked at Bradley University, so not too far from us. But he, he never published anything again. Now, one of the funny things is that for reasons that are a little bit lost, we don't call this the easing model. We call it the Ising model in English. Could you please mute? Okay, so every time somebody does this, I have to go back and I have to mute you all. Yeah. And it's kind of annoying. Yeah, I hear you. I don't know if you can write Oh, really? Thanks a lot. Yeah, that'll be for tomorrow. Mary Jane, please mute yourself. Oh, you know what? Somebody unmuted me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So, where are we now? Okay. All right. We're completely um, we're completely out of sequence now. So I got to go back again. Okay, so we have this model due to uh, easing, the Ising model. Um, I think it frustrates some German speakers because we mispronounce his name. Ising glass, which is something totally different, is pronounced Ising, uh, but some are just used to it and everybody just says Ising, uh, even though we all know it's mispronouncing his name. So. Ising was not able to show that um, this model, in, you know, was a permanent mag a model of a permanent magnet. But in 1941, two prominent physicists, Hans Kramers and Gregory Wanier, were able to show that the two-dimensional Ising model, where you have a square lattice, so here we have spins formed in a two-dimensional pattern, right? That this was probably a theory which had um, two phases, a permanent magnet phase and a, a disordered phase where it wasn't a permanent magnet. So the phase diagram of this theory, if you think about temperature looks like this. There's a critical temperature and here's there's a permanent magnet and above the critical temperature, which is called the Curie temperature, by the way, um, you have no permanent magnet. And the way they did this was really interesting and very clever. They said, okay, let me do a high temperature expansion of the theory. Now, at high temperatures, you know, we expect that the little spins are, are random because thermal fluctuations are really huge. So the little guys are going, well, do I wanna be up or do I wanna be down? Well, it's easy to go back and forth and they don't stay lined up. 
And so the black diagrams that you see in front of you are typical high temperature diagrams that you use to calculate this expansion, which is something they pioneered. And then they observed that what you could do is you could also think of a low temperature expansion where you said, oh, at low temperatures, the spins are mostly up or mostly down. So we go to zero temperature, everybody's up. And then we say, oh, there's a little bit of temperature and it flips down, one spin flips down. And they said, okay, right here, we've got one spin that flips down. And what they observed was that that one flip spit, one spin flip down configuration in green was equivalent to the box diagram at high temperature. And they said, well, okay. So if we repeat that, this diagram where you've got a, a one by two box is equivalent to flipping two boxes or two spins rather at low temperature. And they said, we can map between the low temperature phase and the high temperature phase. And we can get a relationship between the couplings. So this was very clever. You'll notice that this is a pretty complicated looking transcendental equation that relates a high temperature coupling to a low temperature coupling. And by looking at this point, assuming that there's a critical point, they could say, well, at the critical point, the two couplings are the same. And that exact critical point is 0.4407. And they turned out to be completely right. So the two-dimensional Ising model has a Curie temperature, a critical temperature at 0.4407. Okay, and he said, well, okay, this, this is, the easing was wrong. Um, you know, they couldn't quite prove it because they couldn't solve the model, but they could do these low temperature expansions and high temperature expansions. And that was enough to indicate that that was what was probably happening. So, now we're gonna take a jump ahead. We're gonna jump over World War II and we're going to, look at the work of Lev Landau. So Lev Landau was a very gifted theoretical physicist. He was the leader of the famous Moscow School of Theoretical Physics. Um, he was also Jewish. Uh, and uh, Stalin was not fond of um, various ethnic groups in the Soviet Union, including Jews, but also uh, Ukrainians and of course, Estonians and lots of other groups. Um, and Landau was a rising star of theoretical physics when in 1938, he wrote a, um, I guess we would call it a pamphlet or a flyer criticizing Stalin. And so they threw him in, in um, the Soviet jails. And uh, here you see, over here you see a picture of his prison photo, looking a little bit the worse for wear. And uh, Peter Kapitza, who was another Nobel laureate, personally intervened with Stalin to get Landau re released, basically guaranteed Landau's good behavior, okay? Um, and here you see him in uh, later times over on the right, when he looks more like the head of a major uh, Soviet uh, university institute. Um, and Landau did work in all areas of theoretical physics. In fact, he wrote an 11 volume series of books about theoretical physics. Um, and in order to be a part of the Moscow school, you had to pass a comprehensive exam that proved that you knew everything in those 11 books, okay? And these were really comprehensive and they're brilliant, um, but it was tough. Some people, uh, you know, spent 20 years and were sort of admitted as full participants in the school after passing this exam in their 40s. So 
um, you know, very rigorous training. Now, Landau had a general theory, which is in this 11 volume series in the statistical mechanics book, that explains how permanent magnets can occur. And what he said was, well, let me look at the average magnetization as an order parameter that tells me where I am in the phase diagram. He says, well, we, you know, we got something to spin one. And so if there are thermal fluctuations, then it's not gonna be exactly one or minus one, it's gonna be some number in between plus one and minus one. And he said, well, depending on the value of that, we'll know where we are in the phase diagram. If that average value is non-zero, we have a permanent magnet. And if it's not, if it's zero, then we're in the disordered high temperature phase and it's, it's not a permanent magnet. Okay, and he explained this by saying, well, let's look at something called the free energy. And he had a very simple, beautiful explanation that said that for T greater than the Curie temperature, the high temperature phase, the curve looks like the red curve and the minimum is at zero. But if you go below the Curie temperature, the curve turns around and it develops this non-trivial minimum at some value, eta zero, not equal to zero. And he said, well, you can, we, can, we can diagram this and here's the curve. And so here's the permanent magnet phase and here's the eta zero equals zero phase, the disordered phase. And that sounded really good. You know, people were impressed by this. You could generalize this to other kinds of magnets and you could generalize this to other kinds of phase transitions. We call it a phase transition because you notice here that at the Curie temperature, there's an abrupt change from the permanent magnet phase to the disordered phase, from the ordered phase to the disordered phase. And so this was, this was pretty good. There was just one thing wrong with Landau's theory. And I'm gonna go just a little bit, well, I'll, I'll get to, I'll actually get to why it's uh, uh, not quite perfect in just a sec. But in the meantime, over in the West, now remember at this time, this was, this was in the 50s, this work was done in 1957, okay? Um, the communication between the West and the Soviet Union was pretty poor. And in the meantime, somebody, other people were working on these kinds of problems. And a man named Lars Onsager was able to exactly solve the two-dimensional Ising model. So this is the model where you've got um, spins that are up or down in a two-dimensional pattern. And we actually have physical systems that uh, realize this kind of system. You know, they're basically sheets, kind of like graphene is not a permanent magnet, but sheets like graphene, it comes in two dimensional layers and the interactions between uh, atoms and uh, magnetic domains in the same layer is much stronger in these kinds of systems than they are in the third direction. So they're effectively two dimensional. So if you look at Landau's work, he said that when you look at this curve for A to zero, he says that it goes to zero in a, like a certain power law, which is Tc minus T to the one half. Okay, so that's, that's the graph he predicts. But Onsager had this exact solution. And he said, no, 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 in this model, it's, it's Tc minus T to the one eighth. So it's a somewhat uh, actually steeper curve. Um, 
Now, I'm going to tell a little story about Ansager because, you know, we want to get a feel for the personalities involved. It turns out um, Ansager was a terrible teacher. He immigrated to the United States uh, before the war, and he started at um, Johns Hopkins University. And uh, they gave him a job teaching statistical mechanics and thermodynamics because that's what this is. And that's what he was an expert in. And uh, the students were, he, he taught undergraduates and, you know, it, it, was, it was really bad. And they said, well, maybe he's just too smart for them. We'll, we'll make him teach graduate students. And it was still really bad. And, and finally, they let him go, okay? And um, Yale hired him. He had a brilliant reputation as a researcher. And they said, maybe we won't have you teach. You just do research. And after a while, okay, so this is, this is, this is apocryphal history. This is oral history. And I don't know that it actually happened in precisely this way, but um, this is the basic outlines of the story. So he'd been at Yale for a while and they said, oh, you know, Ansager, we're really pleased to have you here. You know, your research is just first rate. Uh, but, you know, we, we've noticed you don't actually have a PhD. And, you know, we know that in Europe things are different. You don't always get the, you know, but this is Yale and everybody has a PhD here. So we'd like to give you a PhD. But in order to give you a PhD, we need a thesis. So do you, do you have some chemistry or physics problem that you've got some notes on that you haven't published and we could have you write it up and it'd be a PhD thesis and then we could give you a PhD. And uh, Ansager said, well, you know, I, I don't know. Um, oh, wait a minute. I got, okay, when I was solving the Ising model, I had to work out some stuff about elliptic functions. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe I've still got my notes on, on this math stuff. Maybe that would be okay. And, you know, the physics department chair is saying, well, I don't know, but, you know, sure, give it to me. I'll take it over to the guys in the math department and see what they think. So, you know, the physics department chair goes to the math department chair and says, we've got this problem with Ansong. We want to give him a PhD. Do you think this would, this is the kind of work that would, would be okay for, um, you know, a, a, you know, a, a thesis? And the math department got chairs that takes this notes and looks them over and says, well, I'm going to show them to some experts. And a couple of weeks later, the math department chair comes to the physics department chair. And he says, okay, I've shown it to the best people in our department. And we all agree that this man is a tremendous genius. And we'd like to offer him a job as a professor in the math department. So if you're not going to give him a PhD, we're going to give him a PhD. And, you know, he's going to be a professor in our department. And they worked it out. But in fact, Ansager was a, a great genius. You know, he was um, an expert in physical chemistry and uh, theoretical physics, and as it turns out, in mathematics. And his solution of this model is regarded as a, a great tour de force. I mean, it's, it's, it's right up there with, uh, you know, some of Einstein's best work, okay? And it's been solved many times in many different ways since Ansager was first able to solve it. But I just thought I'd mention that probably the most interesting solution uh, lies in a 1964 paper by Lieb, Elliot Lieb, Schultz and Mathis, which used the same techniques as the BCS, Bardeen cooper schrieffer theory of superconductivity. And this work demonstrated that the two-dimensional Ising model was solvable because it could be mapped into a theory of free relativistic fermions. In other words, there is something inside the uh, Ising model which makes it behave somehow like an elementary particle. And this was a, a deep insight that led also to a lot of uh, fruitful work. Um, you know, so a surprising connection between a classical spin model 
and uh, the BCS model of superconductivity. So now we're moving on to uh, the 70s. And I wanna spend a little time about talking about two other men. Uh, Michael Fisher uh, just passed away in late 2021. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about their work in the next few slides. And I just want to spend a little time explaining to you their stature in theoretical physics. So as you can see from the list on the left, um, they won a lot of prizes. Okay, the Boltzmann Medal, the Buckley Prize, the Ansager Prize, the Lorentz Medal. Uh, Kadnoff was won, won the Newton Medal from uh, the British Institute of Physics. Uh, Kadnoff served as the president of the American Physical Society. Um, he also won the National Medal of Science from uh, President uh, Clinton. So these are guys who did everything but win the Nobel Prize, okay? And I'm going to explain their work in the next few slides and I'll talk about who did and perhaps why, okay? So, oh, I, I, should, I should say that um, personally, so, I worked very briefly, briefly for Leo Kadanoff um, one summer when I first started graduate school. He was transitioning uh, from Brown University to the University of Chicago. And, um, you know, it was very, very interesting, but I don't think I impressed him very much. And he didn't take me with him to the University of Chicago, but to be fair, that would have been very unusual to take somebody who hadn't even had her, his uh, first year of graduate school behind him. Um, but I certainly learned a lot from him. He's one of the, was one of the most brilliant people I've, I've ever met, honestly. Um, you know, a handful of people. Uh, this, this picture of him uh, is, is good. Uh, I think, except it really doesn't twinkle, it doesn't capture the twinkle in his eyes. He had very blue eyes. And when he looked at you, you, you knew that, you know, he was like you were in his headlights and he was giving you his full attention. Very, very striking, uh, kind man, in fact, I think. So, so remember that um, Kramers and Wanier had a, a method that told us that the ordered phase, the low temperature phase of a magnet was equivalent to the, dis, to the high temperature phase. And, you know, an obvious question is, well, look, the phase that has the permanent magnet is obviously different from the high temperature phase because you've got this curve that goes like this. And what does it mean to say that these two are equivalent or mapped into each other by duality? Well, Kadnoff and his postdoc Siva in 1971 gave us an answer for that. And they said, well, here's, there's, there's something else which they called a disorder parameter. So eta is the order parameter, but they said there's a second thing that's a disorder parameter. And even though we can't see it, when we look at the disordered phase, it looks like random spins to us. There's an analogous thing that is zero in the ordered phase but non-zero in the disordered phase. So they really are dual. And the, they gave an algorithm, a procedure for measuring these disorder operators. And if you wanna look at two disorder operators, you go to the dual lattice 
Yeah, just like Kramer's and Wanye duality, right? So it's the points in between in the middle of the squares. And you put a string in the model so that spins on different sides of the string want to be opposite. So you're changing the energies involved so that strings on uh, that spins on opposite sides of the string want to be down. And they showed that this defined the disorder operator. And they showed that the results were independent of the string. So here you see two different strings. but the same beginning and ending point. So they represent the same physics. So you have to choose a string, but nothing matters. Not, you know, the path itself doesn't matter. You could take something that goes to the moon and comes back and that would be okay too. Very interesting. Now, during the same period, people were studying quite assiduously the critical indices. So we've, talked about one critical index, which is this guy, the magnetization. And Landau theory says that the critical exponent, beta is what it's called, is a half. Onsager solved the two-dimensional Ising model and showed that it was actually one eighth. And people said, well, what, what, what's going on? Is Landau right? Is Ansaga right? Is there something special about the two-dimensional Ising model? Let's find out. And so people compiled using theory and simu computer simulation and actual real materials, which of course is the ultimate experimental test to determine in various situations, two dimensions, three dimensions, et cetera, whether or not Landau was right or Ansager was right. And this is, these are essentially the values they got. So if you look at, for example, the magnetization, Landau says one half, Ansager says one eighth. You go to the three dimensionalizing model, it's not exactly solvable, but it's 0.33. And actually we know these numbers to five decimal places these days. Um, but I'm not showing that, okay? If you do a different model where the spins are not just up down, but they, they move in a plane, okay? That's why it's called XY, they move in the XY plane. So it's like a rotor, right? Like a helicopter blade, it's 0.35. If you look at a model where the spins are able to move around a surface of a sphere or a ball, it's 0.37. So they're all different depending on the dimension of the space of um, the system, a three-dimensional lattice, a two-dimensional lattice, and the symmetry group or the nature of the order parameter, whether it's a up-down or a XY spin or a three-dimensional spin, you get different answers. And if you measure other critical indices like the specific heat, which is a measure of how much energy it takes to go from one phase to another, or the susceptibility, which measures the response of the spins to an external magnetic field, you also get different critical indices. And these critical indices are alpha, beta, and gamma. And we've got a whole host of others. There's delta, there's uh, Z, there's nu, lots of critical indices. But if you look at the rows here, you'll notice that there's a really interesting pattern. If I take alpha plus two beta plus gamma, I get two for Landau theory. Zero plus two times a half plus one is two. If I take the Ising model, I take zero plus two times one eighth, that's one quarter plus seven quarters, that's two. If I take the three-dimensionalizing model, alpha plus two beta plus gamma equals two. Three dxy, two. Three-dimensional Heisenberg, two. And in fact, if you look at any model, like you look at liquid gas transitions, 
So for example, water has a phase transition. It's a transition in the density of the liquid and the density of the gas phase. Um, it's not like the uh, freezing or boiling phases. It's actually a special point in the phase diagram. But if you measure that kind of critical index experimentally, it's actually the same as the three-dimensional Ising model. So what we're seeing is a set of universal rules that says that the critical exponents are, fall into classes and they obey certain magic rules like this one which is called the Rushbrook equality, by the way. Um, and this is very mysterious looking. Who, who would have predicted this? And you see, it's relating things that we, we think, you know, have totally different physics, right? I mean, liquids and gases are not the same as magnets, okay? If you say, well, what's the relationship between the physics of liquids and gases and the physics of ferromagnets, the things that stick to your refrigerator? You, you wouldn't say that there's, well, there's an obvious connection, but somehow there is this deep connection. And the deep connection is what we call critical universality. And this is one of the most powerful ideas we have in, in 20th century physics. Now, Kadanoff and Fisher, went on and what they did, one of the things they are best known for, although they both are known for many, many achievements in physics, they developed a set of methods for describing these magnets and systems at different scales. And the, the whole picture is captured in what we call Kadanoff block spins. And the idea is that you have, say, a two-dimensional lattice. And so the little colored circles are the spins. And you say, well, OK, suppose I want to zoom out. Instead of zooming in and looking at the microscopic physics of each individual spin, I zoom out a little and I look at the average spin over a block of four. And I say, well, Okay, that also can be regarded as a spin. And if the spins interact, okay, so if each spin interacts with its nearest neighbors, that's going to introduce an interaction between blocks of spin and nearby blocks of spin. Right? And they said, well, okay, so maybe there is a map from the system that consists of original spins that we started from and these block spins and the coupling of the block spins is a function of the original coupling. And so you can imagine that what we do is as we zoom out, as our blocks get bigger and bigger and bigger, we're going to different couplings. And what they showed was very similar in spirit to what Kramers and Wanier showed, was that this block spin transformation had a, if it had a fixed point, then that fixed point was the critical point. Moreover, because these are mathematical functions and not physical systems, it's possible to see that systems that have a lot of the same symmetries, like the same dimension of space and the same symmetry group, like up-downness, that the function K prime will be the same. And by doing this, they were able to explain that there are these universality classes and the universality classes are determined by this renormalization group transform. So really it's like focusing and defocusing your camera to get a clearer picture at 10,000 feet, 5,000 feet, 
one meter, uh, you know, a centimeter microscopic. And it was a, it's a brilliant idea. It built on some ideas from particle physics, which I don't have time to go into. But it was a great idea. And it was pretty successful, but it was not precisely successful because the real space method that they used introduced approximations and could not be systematically approved, improved. Now, Wilson, now along came Leo Ken Wilson, who was a professor at Cornell. Okay. Now, Fisher was at Cornell and Kadnoff was at Brown and Wilson was interested in the problem of phase transitions. He was a particle physicist by training, um, but so far in his career around 1970, um, he had not produced much that was really outstanding. In fact, he hadn't published very many papers at all. And so it was sort of an open question as to whether or not he would get tenure at Cornell. And what happened, and this is again a story, which we don't know, but Hans Bethe, very famous Nobel Prize winning physicist, the sort of the, the elder statesman of the Cornell physics department said, you know, Wilson is very smart. He may not have done much good yet, but I think he's very smart and I think we'll do some very good things. And I think we should give him tenure. And everybody said, oh, well, okay, Beta says he's good. We'll, we'll give him tenure, okay? They don't do this for everybody. And Kadanoff and Fisher taught Wilson what they knew about critical phenomena. And Wilson came up with a different approach to the renormalization group where instead of Wils uh, Kadanoff's block spins, he said, well, what we need to do is we need to get rid of the high momentum modes. These are the most energetic modes of the system, which are responsible for local fluctuations. And when we integrate those out, we'll be left with a theory which only describes the low momentum modes, which corresponds to large distances. So it's a, another way of getting at the large distance behavior of the theory, but it's done in momentum space and it's actually done using Feynman diagrams, okay? It's the natural language of particle physics. And so that was an innovation but what was really very clever about Wilson's work was that he showed that a good way to understand the system is, you know, we've been talking about one-dimensionalizing models, two-dimensionalizing models, three-dimensionalizing models. He said, let's think about four-dimensionalizing models. Now there aren't four-dimensional spatial dimensionalizing models, but we can certainly think about it theoretically. And he said, furthermore, let's think about what happens if we make the dimension of space just a little bit less than four. Suppose we made it 3.99 dimensions. What would that mean? And he showed that there was a systematic expansion in epsilon, the number of the number four minus D. So you can say 3.99 dimensions d equals three is epsilon equals one, d equals two is epsilon equals two. And he showed that this was a systematic procedure which could be indefinitely improved. And this was the basis for our modern understanding of the renormalization group and critical phenomena and critical universality for which um, Ken Wilson received the Nobel Prize in 1982. Now, a lot of people, myself included, were surprised that the Nobel Prize was not given to Fisher, Kadanoff, and Wilson, because you can give the prize, according to their Nobel Prize Committee's rules, to up to three people, but they just gave it to Wilson. And I, I have to say, I, I never heard Kadanoff, uh, you know, say anything about it, you know, like, oh, I should have gotten the prize too, or Fisher and I should have gotten the prize. Um, but Wilson, in an interview with the um, APS uh, archives people, 
uh, said that when the prize was announced, he was really surprised because he thought that if he got it, that Kadanoff and Fisher should get it too. But the Nobel Prize Committee disagreed and gave it just to him. Now, Wilson was a true genius. Um, you don't have to do a lot of things to be a genius, but you just have to do something really great. And Wilson did two really great things. Uh, three, if you count the condo, his work on the condo effect, but his work on the renormalization group won him the Nobel Prize. And um, then he also did in a paper in 1974, he wrote a paper on a lattice approach to the study of quarks and gluons. And that was the beginning of the field of lattice gauge theory, which is the field that I work in, which is the most powerful theoretical tool we have to study quarks. And of course it uses the renormalization group in an intrinsic and important way. So uh, not only did he uh, establish the modern field of uh, critical phenomena and the renormalization group, he established a totally uh, separate field, lattice gauge theory with, with his work, uh, both in the 1970s. So I guess Beta was right. Um, in you know, in saying that Wilson might do something good. Now, um, I just want to briefly go back to duality for a minute and finish up. Okay, so if if you look at Maxwell's equations and you think about electric and magnetic fields, there's an asymmetry between electric fields and magnetic fields, because we know that electric fields can come from point charges, but magnetic fields come from dipole magnets, right? They have a North Pole and a South Pole, like a compass. And if you try to take a magnet and say, let me, let me break off the North and South Pole into two parts, you don't end up with a North magnetic pole and a South magnetic pole separately. You end up with two smaller dipole magnets. So that's a little weird, right? Because in a lot of ways, electric and magnetic fields are kind of the same, but there are electric monopoles, which are electric charges, but magnetic dipoles, north-south poles. And Maxwell's equations say that there are no magnetic monopoles, but that's an assumption that's based on experiment. Maxwell didn't see them, we don't see them, so we don't put them in. But Heaviside noticed back in 1884 that it's easy to add magnetic monopoles to Maxwell's equations and it's something you can do. And back in, um, we're back in the 20s and 30s, the early days of quantum mechanics. And Paul Dirac, the brilliant British Nobel Prize winner, uh, noticed something special about magnetic monopoles. Now Dirac's famous, most famous work is the Dirac equation. And it's a relativistic generalization of the Schrodinger equation. It's absolutely fundamental. It describes electrons and quarks. Um, and he won the, won the Nobel Prize very quickly in 1933 after his 1928 work because it was clearly important and correct because the Dirac equation, unlike the Schrodinger equation, predicts the existence of electron spin, which they knew existed. It predicts the existence of antiparticles, positrons and other antiparticles. And it predicts that the magnetic field, an external magnetic field, couples to spin via a coupling that includes the angular part of the what we call the orbital angular momentum, the field of say an electron going in a circle around the nucleus, plus the intrinsic spin of the electron. And they're not weighted the same, it's L plus two S. The two different spins are weighted differently. And this was a big mystery before Dirac, but Dirac said, look at my equation, it predicts L plus two S, which we call the G factor, which is, is two to leading order. Schwinger and Feynman got the Nobel Prize for showing that there are corrections to the G factor, by the way. Now, in 1931, 
Dirac said, well, let me think about magnetic monopoles. Could they exist? And what he showed was, sure, we can have magnetic monopoles, but if you want magnetic monopoles to exist in quantum mechanics, um, there must be an arbitrary string, which we now call the Dirac string, that secretly connects north monopoles to south monopoles. So it's kind of like a dipole, but it's a string we can't see. It's an invisible string. Yeah, I know, quantum mechanics. But the path of the string is arbitrary. Now, have we heard this before? Yes, we have. Because in, when Kadanoff and Siva did disorder variables for the Ising model, they said you have to introduce a string on the lattice, but the path of the string is arbitrary. So there's a little similarity there. And then Dirac said, well, in quantum mechanics, if you're going to have an invisible string, you have to quantize the magnetic charge so that the magnetic charge is a multiple, an integer multiple of two pi over the electric charge. So it's quantized. And furthermore, if the electric charge is small, the magnetic charge is strong, a duality relation that relates strong and weak physics. And this is something that has deep roots to Kramer's one duality in magnetic systems. So another kind of interesting connection, right? Now I'm gonna finish up, I know it's late, but just give me three minutes and um, I'm gonna tell you something that's really recent and really mind blowing. So no Nobel prizes here yet, maybe it'll never be Nobel prize winning work because it's highly theoretical. This is work that comes out of string theory. Um, in 1997, Juan Maldacena, uh, who was then at Harvard, now at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, conjectured a relationship between gravity and modern gauge theory particle systems like electromagnetism and QCD, basically things like that we build the standard model out of. Now, anti de Sitter space is a curved space time that's used in general relativity. There's, uh, we're more used to act de Sitter space, but anti de Sitter space is also possible. This is what it looks like it's a curved manifold. If you look at two dimensional anti de Sitter space, it's a space that looks like a saddle. If you try to draw a triangle on an anti de Sitter space, instead of adding up to 180 degrees, the angles of the triangle add up to less than 180 degrees. And Maldacena said, well, if you look at a gauge theory on this anti de Sitter space, then you can look at the boundary of the space, the, you know, sort of the far infinity behavior, you know, far out from the center of the space. And, in, you know, instead of seeing something that looks like general relativity, you'll see something that looks like a gauge theory, and it'll be a critical field theory. It'll be a, a field theory at its critical point. And so this critical field theory lives on the boundary out here on the outer cylinder of this um, sp curved space time. And this is a realization of what Tohoft another Nobel laureate called the holographic principle, which says that the nature of a quantum system is determined by the physics on its boundary. Think about black holes and you, maybe you'll see where we're headed with this. And Maldacena's work, although still a conjecture technically, has passed a lot of consistency tests and has been applied to QCD, the, the theory of quarks and gluons to condensed matter physics, and is considered a, an important tool in the modern physics arsenal. Now, I'm gonna finish up with a talk that I just heard last month. It was a talk at the uh, Lattice Virtual uh, Seminar Series, which is run out of MIT, um, and they meet, at this point, I think we're meeting every other week. And uh, it was based around this recent paper that came out in last November. And um, 
what the authors of this paper did was they said, let's look at the curved two-dimensional space, ADS2. And this is what it looks like. This is a projection map. This is like looking at the, um, a map of the Earth's surface, which is spread out and flattened somehow. The, the, uh, the connections are right, but the distances are all wrong. And so this is a, actually a square, well, a lattice made out of triangles. And the triangles are all the same size, but it's distorted because it's projected. So this is a curved space-time with negative curvature. It's ADSS2. And what they did was they put Ising model spins on each site of the lattice, and they simulated it using modern lattice gauge theory techniques. And then they measured the behavior of the spins of the boundary theory. So on a computer, you can't go to infinity, but you can go pretty far out. And so they're looking at the boundary behavior, which is one dimensional. And they measured the critical indices, the critical behavior of this one dimensional theory that lives on the boundary. And what they found out was that unlike Easing's model, which in one dimension had no critical temperature, their model on this curved space, time, curved space was essentially critical for all values of the temperature. And moreover, it was critical for all those values. And here, what they've done is they've measured two different critical indices the one called delta in two different ways. And you see they measure it from their simulations in two different ways and they get pretty good agreement. And every point along here from about 2.3 to 3.7 is in fact a, a unique critical point. So instead of having no critical point like the one dimensional Ising model or one, or sorry, no critical point like D equals one and one critical point like D equals two, they get a whole line of critical points, which is more or less what you'd expect if you believed in Maldacena's um, conjecture. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you for your patience. But I wanted to be able to show you how, you know, a relatively simple idea from 1924 um, by a man who only produced this, this one piece of work has resonated up through decades to the forefront of modern physics. And, you know, I wanted to be able to share some of the excitement and the history, and I hope I've been able to do that. So thank you all. Um, go ahead and unmute yourselves if you want to ask uh, uh, questions. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, we're back. So does any, anybody have any questions or did I, did I lose everybody 20 minutes ago? Well, um, there was a request that I, I tie this lecture to uh, MRIs and used in diagnostic radiation, radiology. Um, and I, I didn't do that. But I will tell you that there is sort of a connection. So it's from the very end. So you know that um, one of the things that's used in um, MRIs today is the possibility of uh, three building three-dimensional images of, for example, us when we have health issues, and that's something called tomography. And basically the way you, you do that is you take a, a beam 
and um, you uh, project that through the body at various angles. And from those one dimensional pictures of what uh, the, the body density looks like, you build up a three dimensional image. And so um, that is in fact a little bit like what holography is, but they're actually a little bit different. Okay, Mr. Uh, Al, can you, can you speak? Do I need to unmute you? I can, um, you all could, you all should be able to unmute yourselves. Wave if okay, you can. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, 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 great. Ask your question. Nice uh, to see I was you. delighted to hear your uh, anecdote about Lausanne's auger. I was at Yale between 1954 and 1957 in the chemistry department. His oh, office yeah. was one flight of stairs above mine and we had frequent contact. Uh, he was not only the smartest guy I ever actually met, but uh, he had quite a dry sense of humor. Uh, are you familiar with his tombstone? No, no. Tell, tell me about it. Uh, well, of course, uh, I, I promise this will be the only anecdote I'll foist on you. But uh, at the same time at Yale, there was another theorist named Jack Kirkwood. Oh, yeah, very, also pretty well known. He's yeah. a very well known theorist, also. And uh, the two of them were pals. When uh, Kirkwood died, he was buried in New Haven in a New Haven cemetery. And on his tombstone, there was a long list of all his awards that he'd received for theoretical work. And when Anzager died, he was buried in the same cemetery. And he simply had his name on it. And there was an asterisk after the name. And then at the bottom of the tombstone, there was a reference, the asterisk appeared, and it said, Nobel Prize, etc." cetera. Yes, oh yeah, nice, nice, yeah. Yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes the uh, sense of humor of Nobel Prize winners is uh, uh, pointed. Now, it's interesting, though, that you mention all this because, of course, the, the most famous tombstone in this branch of physical chemistry and thermodynamics and statistical mechanics is Boltzmann's, okay? So Boltzmann is, in some sense, the founder, 19th century founder, of modern statistical physics. And on, he, he actually despaired later in life and he committed suicide, but he had carved on his tombstone his most famous formula, S equals K log, logarithm of omega, I've the formula seen that. for the entropy, yeah. And um, so, you know, there's this, there's this history in the field of putting things on your tombstone. Of course, you know, Kirkwood and Ansager and Boltzmann, of course, are all working in the same field. And I'll tell you something interesting. There's a modern uh, physics textbook uh, in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. And it, it it's, talks a little bit in the introduction in this textbook to the field. And it said, you know, um, you know, uh, the, fa the field was founded by Ludwig Boltzmann and here's his work and, you know, and uh, of course, Boltzmann committed suicide. Now it's our turn to study statistical mechanics. The implication of course being that maybe it will drive us crazy too. Um, I, and it's, have a as, I have a photo of myself at Boltzmann's tomb. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send, you, yeah. I'll send it to you. <laughs> oh, great, thanks, that would be great. 
So any any other questions? I'm hearing I'm hearing some noise, but I'm not hearing anybody's voice. So I really I really ran over ooh. Is everybody else hearing that buzzing sound? I go, I go. I have one. Yes, please. Okay. When you talk about dimension, you talk about actual physical spaces or just mathematical terms. And those, you talk about two and three dimensions. Is that more of a mathematical artifact? No, no. It's 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 quite real. Um. So, um. So you know, in fact, so condensed matter theorists can make uh, materials that are um, wires. And, you know, as long as, you know, they're much thinner in two directions than they are in one direction, uh, these systems can be essentially one dimensional. So um, we can make these, we can make two dimensional systems, which are layered systems. And sometimes like in graphene, they're just really two dimensional. And sometimes there are just three-dimensional systems where the, the interactions are strong in the layer and the, they're weak between layers. Um, but of course, in terms of theory, we can, um, we can make anything we want. As you could see, you know, they could build a effective uh, uh, Ising model on a curved space-time on the computer and actually simulate it. So, of course, you know, when, so when I first learned about Wilson's work, and I was, I was an undergraduate at the time, and, you know, it was just very mind-blowing to say, oh, well, 3.99, oh, what the heck does that mean? And really, what it, it means mathematically is that we have a technique for doing what mathematicians called an analytical continuation of the dimension. Um, and it's, it's well-defined, it's not completely crazy. It turns out that um, building on the works of uh, Kadanoff and uh, Migdal, Migdal was a, a famous Russian theoretical physicist from the Landau School. Uh, building on that work, people were able to build uh, physical models that, you know, that we could draw of systems in say 2.5 dimensions uh, you know, and they, they, um, you know, they, they make perfect sense as models, uh, and to a certain extent do have physical realizations. So, yeah, and of course, modern string theory uh, typically lives in uh, 10 spatial dimensions plus one time dimension as well. Um, but probably the best way to understand string theory the way, the way to understand string theory is to say, well, we've got three large dimensions, you know, which are our three spatial dimensions, and the seven extra dimensions are actually compact. They're actually some little tiny space. Like, think about Einstein's curved spaces, and, you know, it's, they're very small spaces. And so they're very, they're, they're so small in radius that you know we're we're insensitive to them in some sense, and those uh, small dimensions in string theory are correspond to the extra symmetries of uh, our world that we perceive through things like electric charge and um, magnetic charge, um, the interactions between quarks and gluons, and etc. So that's, that's, that's how string theories are unified uh, field theories in some sense, you know, realizing Einstein's dream uh, by adding extra dimensions, you know. So if, if you, and, and, you know, frankly, the evidence for string theory is not there. There, there is none. And so maybe it's not the right idea at all. But if you sort of treat it as a proof of concept, you realize that things can get pretty strange when you turn a bunch of theorists loose on the universe. Um, and we keep coming up with uh, 
you know, bizarre and interesting ideas. Have you, uh, have, you seen, have you seen the article in Astronomy Magazine in April tying string theory with uh, loop quantum gravity? They had a really interesting article about it. It was whereas loop gravity created space and string theories are embedded in that. It's, it's a really interesting article. Have you seen it? I, I have not seen that particular article. I know a little bit about loop quantum gravity. So, so one of the the huge theoretical issues, which has, as far as I know, no experimental implications at all is how to merge uh, quantum mechanics with general relativity. And um, string theory is one way to do it. Uh, loop quantum gravity is another way to do it. And maybe in some versions they have a relationship. There are other ways to do it at all, uh, as well. There's a way to do it with, with lattice gauge theory, in fact. Um, as far as I know, there's no. Well, this this article this article in April tied loop quantum gravity with uh, string theory. It's pretty interesting. It's in the April issue. You might want to check it out. I think uh, yeah, I'll, I'll 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 get to it eventually. I, I'm you know like like a lot of people today. I have more reading. <laughs> I get to. This was. Yeah. Did you connect them together? Well, I thought they were separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I should, I should say that, um, you know, uh, you know, both uh, CERN and Fermilab put out sort of professional to, you know, seriously interested uh, layperson magazines that uh, you know can be quite interesting. So if you're you're sort of interested in, you know, going beyond. Um, you know, what you'll find in, say, you know, magazines like Discover, which are excellent. Right. You can go to the CERN and Fermilab websites and uh, you, can, you, can, you can find uh, these, these, art, these kinds of articles too. Yeah, and gen generally they're, they're really pretty good. Yeah, some of this stuff gets so far above the head of the average person, even a teacher like me, it's just like, you know, you guys are in a different world, sir, with the math. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, sometimes it, 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 does, it does seem that way. And, you know, I, I realized that, you know, it, today, you know, I was really trying to emphasize the personalities and the connections more than any one particular idea, right? Right. Um, because, you know, that's, that's part of the fun. Um, it's, it's, it's good, you know, we, we enjoy doing our own research. And, you know, right now I'm, I'm doing some work with, uh, an undergraduate here at Washington U and, um, and uh, his sister, who's a graduate student at MIT. Um, and uh, we're using actually uh, spin systems and duality. And we're working on uh, problems related to quarks at um, finite density, like in uh, neutron stars. And so it's, it's, it's pretty fundamental work. We're not close to, saying definitive things about uh, neutron stars, but, uh, you know, th that's, that's the direction we're headed. I mean, so it's, it's, the, it's the living aspect of, of science that I, I wanted to emphasize and how the ideas, you know, it's not like we wake up one morning and go, I think I'll have a crazy idea today. No, you know, we build on somebody else's crazy idea. I would say an update to what's going on with Stern if you had a chance, a lecture on that, because I think most of us have it a whole, whole lot lately. Were they, are they at a dead, are they at a, you know, a dead end or what? I haven't seen anything really other than Higgs. Oh, well, so there's a lot going on. Um, and, you know, I would say that in some sense, you know, we, we've, we've sort of reached a point where the standard model if the standard model is wrong, then it's very subtly wrong. And we have experimentalists and theorists who are working very hard on that. We still don't know about dark energy and dark matter, working very hard on that. But there's also a lot of ideas that are going on in the background about the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. Um, what about the search for supersymmetry? They haven't got any further on that, have they? Well, you know, no, that would be beyond standard model physics. 
And, um, you know, when I say that there's no indication of anything beyond the standard model, I'm including uh, supersymmetry. I think most string theorists, if we saw s indications of supersymmetry, they would probably take it as an indication that string theory is correct. Because um, string theory, uh, as we practice it today, is uh, pretty much, um, you know, a, a theory with supersymmetry built into it. But what I was going to say is that in the background, we're, we're in a, a, a time of what I would call designer physics. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are using that kind of phrase. We have an ability to construct on our computers, in our theories, and in a lot of ways in experiment, you know, um, designed models of theoretical phenomena. So for example, there's the theoretical concept of topological insulators, um, which maybe uh, we are starting to see experimental realizations of, which could be use, used to build quantum computers that use a lot of the theoretical machinery, um, you know, of uh, magnetic monopoles, and you know the ideas of duality and Kramers and Lanier. Um, a lot of this is driven by what I would call quantum information science, you know, the drive for quantum computing, quantum cryptography, but it bleeds over into um, the basics, the fundamental assumptions about quantum physics and how it works, the, the ideas that troubled uh, Niels Bohr and Einstein. And it also, uh, you know, has a relation to things like black hole physics and the black hole information paradox. And it's such a vast field that honestly, I don't think any one person or any one physics department can keep up with all the work that's going on today. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, so it, it may seem like each one of us is doing some random crazy thing, but, you know, if you apply your renormalization group filter and you go out to 20,000 feet, then you, you do see a, a pattern, you know, in which in some sense we're all working on the same thing or working on related ideas. Um, but you know we're we're definitely in this 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 time of of, of designer physics problems, and it's not just condensed matter physics. For example, there's a lot of interest in um, building uh, black hole analogs using, for example, fluid systems or acoustic systems. So you could build things that have black hole like horizons using acoustic and fluidic systems. And those, uh, those experimental programs are starting to get somewhere. So that's pretty exciting too. Yeah, so a lot of stuff going on. Okay, well, it's almost 11.30 and I, I thank you for hanging, hanging with me. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed getting a peek into the uh, lives and times of uh, some of these famous figures. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I enjoy in teaching uh, my courses is, you know, telling people a little bit, telling our students a little bit about, uh, you know, the people whose work that they're learning about. And I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, so next week you'll, have what I think will be a, a very fun and interesting lecture from uh, Carl Bender, whom I think many of you know. And then um, uh, in two weeks, it'll be Zohar Anusinov, who will talk about uh, the relationship between uh, machine learning and uh, modern physics ideas uh, about information and statistical physics. And I think, I think that'll be fun. Too. Okay, Michael. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
I just want to thank you for this. I am uh, sort of in, uh, I'm an anthropologist and I, even though I don't understand many of the details at all, I really feel like I get benefit from these wonderful lectures because um, I think the, the main principles behind this thinking can apply to the biological and the human, specifically human uh, social systems also in a broad way. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, and, and you, you actually bring up an excellent point which is that uh, the, uh, the ideas of universality yeah. and the renormalization group um, have in fact uh, been applied to biological systems and to social systems and networking. Yes. And that's in some sense, that's uh, part of the reason why Professor Nusinov, who is uh, a, an expert um, on uh, statistical mechanics, and, and critical phenomena and universality uh, is interested in the behavior of networks, which includes, of course, human networking. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's not as easy to make progress. Um, people are even harder than magnets, as it turns out. Yes, I agree. As I'm sure you know. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, these are very, very powerful and general ideas. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're, they, they are making their way out of particle physics where they started into many, many branches of uh, the sciences and the social sciences. So yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank all you. right, so I will, uh, I hope to see you all next Saturday morning. Great, take care, be well. And I look forward to seeing you all again. <laughs>